Come on. Woo! I like it. Come on. What a joy it is to be here at the Masters at University. Come on, everybody say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Woo! Now go, la, 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 la. Now you're sounding African. I like it. I like it. Well, what a joy it is to be here this morning at the Masters University. And uh, it is a great joy and honor to open God's Word with you. My name is Shannon Hurley, and I am most famously known for being the father of Ethan and Zeke. Come on. Ethan and Zeke, I hope you guys know them. And uh, I also am the father of Elisa Grace Hurley, who just graduated last year. No, two years ago, something like that. <laughs> and time is flying as you get older. <laughs> and, uh, and I also have my son, Ezek, uh, Elijah, here. Elijah, stand up. Come on, let everybody see you. Come on, stand up. Wave to everybody. And I have my wife here, Danielle, the prettiest, most attractive woman on the face of the earth. Come on right here, Danielle, stand and just wave. And uh, it is a joy to be here because this is a school I went to. I had the privilege of sitting where you sat. And my heart's desire this morning is to encourage you as if it was me sitting in that crowd. I have the privilege of having eight children. Three are biological and five are adopted. We also care for about another 40 other kids out of our home. And that's just because I have a great wife. But it is such a joy to stand here and open God's word with you because I am probably one of those most unlikely candidates to do so. This school right here is an awesome school. You guys will look back, I hope, in the rest of your lives and say that you went to the best university there is. And I want you to praise God for such a privilege. This school means a lot to me because it had a, tr a tremendous impact in my life. I am a different man today because of this institution. And I really want to even take this opportunity to thank servants who have been serving so long here. Not for pay, but because of their love for you as students and their desire to see you know and love Jesus Christ. Such servants like Tom Halstead and Beely and Mr. Mackey and Frazier and Dr. Stead and Mrs. Bloomfield. Come on, Mrs. Bloomfield, uh-huh. Dr. Hill and Varner and Mrs. Lawson. These are people that were there when I was there. And that was 20, almost 25 years ago that I was here. When I was here, there was a girl I met in the name of Danielle. She was playing the piano. She was a freshman. I was a senior and freshman. I mean, seniors, if you're guys, go up to the freshmen. They don't know any better, all right? She was playing, <laughs> call it wisdom, call it what you want, all right? They think you're all a stud because you're all big and, and need to shave. I had a goatee coming out, my, out the bottom of my hand and my hair looked like, I don't know. But anyhow, she was playing the piano and the Shekinah glory came down on her. And I'm like, there she is. And I started drooling from the back row. And God in his grace enabled me to marry that beautiful woman 25 years ago. Woo! Arr. I'm encouraging you guys to actually step up. Come on. But it was just yesterday that I was sitting where you are. And with that, I had a heart's desire to know and love Christ. I wanted to know him. I wanted to love him. 
But I wasn't from the typical Christian home. I didn't know all the other things that you're supposed to be. I didn't know that you're supposed to dress this way, talk this way. I didn't know all the different Christianity things. All I knew was I love my God's word and I love God. I remember being confronted on many occasions because I was too flirty. And I was. But when I came into the college, I just never felt like I was like belonged. There was a sense in which I just, I didn't feel, I felt like I was a fish out of water. But God knew that. And, but the school was awesome because it upheld a standard of righteousness and holiness. And I knew that I didn't meet that standard. I knew that I, I, I was not where I needed to be in perfection. And it was a humbling reality, but I, I just began to just say, Lord, help me love your word, love you, and trust for you to do the rest. And I, from this campus, I, when I was a sophomore, I went on a go trip. It wasn't called go trip. Then I went on a missions trip. And I went because I, to Africa. And I went around the tent and tried to find which place should I go. And I'm like, Utah, that's not a missions trip. Come on. And I thought, well, Africa, that's missions. Come. Woo, yeah. So I went to Africa, and little did I know that God would call me to Africa later in my life. When I got there, I began to go and just realize that people are hurting around the world. And I realized that I, by God's grace, have been born from the greatest country in the world, America. And that is God's kindness and his goodness to me. While I was here, uh, while I was there, I also realized that there are medical problems and people are suffering in major ways. And I was completely oblivious to it. When I left Uganda and I came back, the Lord just began to work in my heart this passion for Africa. I graduated from the Master's University, the biblical counseling major, and then I went to seminary. To be honest with you, I didn't like seminary at all. Because it was so hard academically, but that's exactly where I needed to be. I had one man from Grace Church say, Shannon, you need to learn to sit your bum in the chair. If you're going to love people, you love them by studying the word of God so you can preach the word of God. And that was exactly what I needed to hear. I went one semester and I thought, I'm not going back. This is dumb. I had another man in my life say, Shannon, then do us a favor. If you don't go to seminary, don't ever step into the pulpit. That sounds unkind, but it's also what I needed to hear because if I am going to uphold the word of God, I must be willing to, to sit down and study it like its value, in light of its value. So therefore, I went to the master's seminary. I graduated with my master's degree. While I was there, I needed a job. So I decided to, to I ended up getting employed to sell toys. Now, the company was called Beverly Hills Teddy Bear Company. It's still near here. And what I did was I did custom stuffed animals. So I could take a picture, like a picture of Harry, and turn him into a stuffed animal. I think he'd be a great stuffed animal. And uh, I would, what I would do is, is, is if you could buy a thousand pieces, I could make it. I thought about doing a John MacArthur stuffed animal, but I was afraid people might idolize it or something. <laughs> but God in his grace allowed me to bl be, blossom in that stage and be blessed immensely. Of all things, one of my major accounts was Hallmark Canada. I began to do the Incredible Hulk and Lion King and all kinds of stuffed animals for them. But my biggest claim to fame was I produced Aflac ducks all across the country, all across really the world even. Everybody say Aflac, 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 right? Come on. 
That's just music to my ears. Come on, come on, tell me it, tell me it. Uh-huh, come on. Come on, one more time. Oh, you didn't do the ending. <laughs> my son said I'm a little crazy, so I'm just living up to it. But here I am in seminary, flying all over Asia, all over the U.S., producing Aflac ducks. We sold millions of ducks, and the Lord just blessed it immensely. And I here had resources I didn't ever think I would have. I graduate from seminary, but I know that, that I am not called to sell toys. And I feel this burden for ministry. I feel burdened to help people know truth because I didn't know truth. I grew up in a church all my life that didn't know any truth. All I did was at 12 years old, the Lord saved me, and I started studying my Bible on my own. I realized that I could be a tree planted by the streams of water if I meditate on God's word day and night. So I simply de dedicated from 12 years old to read my Bible every day, trusting God would do the work, and I would thus be this tree. And God's word is so true. When you delight yourself in the law of the Lord and you meditate on it day and night, you will be like a tree. And I hope you hear that. And God was growing me as a young person. But everything I studied, I'd go back to my church and they would tell me something contrary. It wasn't until I got to the master's college where they began to teach the Bible. And I, when I saw it in the pages of scripture, I'm like, oh, there it is. I knew that the Bible said this. And I came away with this confidence that this is the word of God. There is a king, and here is his word, and I get to love it and live for it. And then I find myself selling toys, but I knew that there was something greater in this life than selling toys and making a bunch of money. I decided upon graduation to go back to Uganda, Africa. And see what in the world the Lord was doing in Africa. I get over there and I'm thinking to myself, oh my goodness. These people need truth. I get over there and I end up teaching, teaching, teaching. People are coming and flocking to hear the word of God preached. And I'm going, oh my goodness, who's teaching these people? Who's training these people? And at the end of that trip, someone came and asked Shannon, will you come here and train pastors in this country? It made me think back to the fact that I, I remember when I started business and I asked, what in the world does it mean to be a godly businessman? Because I need to know this. And I also I thought to myself, why in the world am I making so much money so quickly? There's got to be a bigger reason. And when I got asked to come to Africa to train pastors, I remember getting on the plane, looking out across Africa landscape and thinking to myself, oh my goodness, am I really willing to leave everything for the sake of this? I remember having me graduated from the master's seminary thinking to myself, do I really believe this Bible to be true? Because I'm about ready to leave everything I know, every comfort, my house over here in Bridgeport for the sake of a calling, for the sake of proclaiming truth to people who need it. Am I really willing to lay it down? At that time I said, yes, I'm willing. I came back and told my wife and she said, what? <laughs> no, she said, wherever you go, I go. I told you she's beautiful. In 2002, I started SOS Ministries, and when I started SOS Ministries, I did it so I could give, because I realized, wait a second, if God blessed all this toy stuff, it's, I need to give it away. And I spent the next four years making money like crazy so I can give it away. And the more I, and, and knowing I'm going to Africa, and, and the more I worked, the more I loved it because I get to advance kingdom purposes. And I realized, one, this is why God had blessed this. And two, this is what it means to be a godly businessman. It's not for this world. It's not for the here. It's for the future. It's for the advancement of the king's name among the nations. 
And that's what I began to live for. And it became exciting even to put money in envelopes and give it to friends who were in need. And so when they open that envelope, they go, praise God. And you know that you are an agent for which God can praise, his name can be praised. And that was the purpose for which I lived those four years. At the end of those four years, I went and moved my family into the middle of Uganda. I knew only one person. It was a person I partnered with, but little did I know he was corrupt and everything I, I was paying for, everything I was throwing to Uganda was being put into an organization with his own name on it. And he basically said when I got there, thank you very much for supporting me. Everything belongs to me. <laughs> you move your family in the middle of Africa and everything belongs to you? I remember telling my, my dad, Dad, if something happens to me when I'm there, please take care of my family. I remember my greatest prayer being, Lord, please protect my children. Please. And God has been so faithful. As I was singing that song even this morning, summer and winter, springtime and harvest, great is thy what? Oh, so true. Those were sweet moments first three years, we had every trial imaginable from every angle. This man tried to push me off the property, but I just stayed there knowing that if Joseph, if, if the God of Joseph is my God, all I need to do is be faithful. Faithful today, trusting God for. Faithful to trusting God for. Listen to that. Say it to your soul. Faithful, trusting God for. That's how we live all of life. From there, I moved into a small little village called Kuba Mitwe. Everybody say Kuba Mitwe. Literally, it means hit the head. John Mubilu, if you guys know him, anybody know John? Come on. John Mubilu, he was living in that village. And we came in there with one message. There is a king and his way is the best. There is a king and his way is the best. And we had two goals. One, to reach that community for Jesus Christ. And two, strengthen God's church all throughout East Africa. We came into the most pagan society. Nobody was married. Promiscuity everywhere. It was nuts. When you read the Bible about Gentiles, that describes my World. And let me just tell you, outside of the Master's College, you have a world that is given over to the lusts and passions of the flesh. And listen, it never pays. It leads to heartache or it leads to pain. It promises joy and it only delivers nothing. And I know that because by the time I came into my village, they, wa they were tired of their sin and, all, and they were ready for the message about the king. I've been in Uganda almost 16 years now, in my village for almost 14. Today, by the grace of God, we have a church filled with 500 Ugandan men and women every Sunday morning. And not only that, but we're about ready to build a church for 1,000 because we have a pastoral training center that's going to fill that church right up. We have a primary school for 530 kids up through, let's say, freshman year of high school. We add a year every, a grade every year. We're reaching out to the, disciple, to, to, to the disabled. We work with Johnny and friends, and we, we help all the disabled within our communities. God is richly blessed. I work with the Baptist Union of Uganda, the Baptist Convention of South Sudan, strengthening their churches, doing conferences for them, just to pump them up for Christ. And, uh, and I, we just established a pastoral training center that just got accredited so we can give degrees. And we are putting together this school that we want to see train pastors fully so we can send them all throughout East Africa. It has been the craziest, the awesomest thing imaginable. Some saying, Shannon, when are you going to ever come back? I said, I have not, no plan to come back. We have to reach Africa. God is at work in Africa like he's not at work at many places. I believe the last story of, of church history will be written in Africa. 
And I want to be right where God is, helping be a catalyst to strengthen his church and get his name proclaimed all throughout the country. Can we say amen? That's my goal. That's my endeavor. And we're going to be at it. And we want you guys to be come and help us. I want you to come on a go trip. Come on. Who's going to come? Yeah. Come on. Who's coming? Who's godly? Raise your hand. We would love to have you come. Guys, just get exposed. You say, what am I going to do? Don't worry about what you're going to do. You get over there and let's party in Africa, all right? <laughs> let's love Jesus together and just serve him. I want to encourage you at my home so you come. I never thought God would call me to Africa, and I praise the Lord for these go trips. Can we clap for the go team? I don't know who's that. Come on. And not only that, but you guys come. Help me as a missionary. Go to seminary and come out as a missionary, all right? What I want to do, I wanted to start with my, my own testimony. I get to preach to you today and on Friday. But I wanted to hear you to hear my heart. I'm just like you. A pilgrim on my way to the celestial city, wanting to please my master along the way. Not wanting to get off the road that leads to that celestial city. And with that, what I want to do this morning is I want you to turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And what I want to do is encourage you from there. One thing I want you to understand up front is that here in Hebrews 11, the writer puts list after list after list of people who are fellow believers. These are not people known for their perfection. Hear this. They're not people known for their perfection. If anything, they're known for their imperfection. But they are people that are known for their faith. They're known for their faith. And I want that to be an encouragement to you right off the bat. Because sometimes we have this idea that we've got to be perfect and then God's pleased. No, God's pleased through his son no matter what. Can we say amen? But it doesn't change the distinction that we have is that we walk and live by faith. The Bible describes us as people of faith. And that's what I want you to see this morning. What I want to do with you is, is really quickly, I'll give you the context. He's going to, in verse 1039, Hebrews 1039, he's going to describe who we are. And 11.1, then he's going to define who we are. And then from verses 2 through the end of the chapter, he's going to describe or illustrate who we are. He's going to, he's going to declare who we are, he's going to define, and he's going to illustrate who we are. I don't want to spend a long time on the first two, but I want to just declare it to you. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 39, read this passage with me. You ready? Uh-oh, are you ready? Come on, say, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Ah, uh -huh. uh -huh. uh, okay, here we go. Hebrews 10, 39. But we are not those who what? We are not those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have what? Faith. To the what? To the preserving of our souls. Say this to yourself. As a Christian, you are a person of faith. You are a person of faith. That's who you are. That's who the Bible describes you as. You are a person of faith. You must understand your identity. Don't look at who you are in terms of perfection, but you're pursue, you are a person of faith, of faith. That's who you are. And it's defined in 11.1. 1. It says this, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. There are two definitions the first one is faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The assurance or the confidence of things hoped for. It's the idea of assurance here is that you have this inward conviction. 
The word actually refers to a foundation. It's this immovable substance, this immovable confidence in what? Things hoped for. You see, when you got saved, when God in his grace lavished faith upon you, saved you by faith, which was a gift from him, he put this immovable substance within you. Something that can't be removed, it's like a foundation. If you put all this down, the foundation remains. This immovable substance, and it's a substance that's hoping for something. That's in you. That's who you are. You can't remove that. That's embedded deep within your own heart, this immovable substance that is hoping for future realities. What are we hoping for? We're hoping for salvation. We're hoping for future reward. We're hoping for a future heaven in the presence of God. Can we say amen? You can't remove that from us. It's deep-seated within us. It's who we are. It's what we live for. It describes who we are. Against all odds, we have this immovable confidence in a future hope. Even though the world around us is telling us we're crazy, we, 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 we can't even hear it. Our ears are closed to it because of this inward God-implanted confidence in this future reality. The second def definition is this conviction for things not seen. This word conviction is this inward compulsion to live out truth. To live for things we can't see. You know what the world will tell us about living for things unseen? They'll tell you it's called what? Stupid. Who lives for what they can't see? Well, listen, every one of us, we live for what we can't see. The world is living for what they see, and but we have this, this thing within us that lives for the unseen. I love what 1 Peter 1.8 says, though you have not seen him, you love him. I've never seen God. Oh, but I love him. Oh, but I live for him. Oh, that I want him. It's crazy. I've left all of my life that I might serve one who I've never seen. Why? Because of this thing called what? Faith, this thing that God put within me by his grace. F.F. F. Ruth described faith as living in hope of the unseen promises of God, and that is exactly what faith is. I don't want to spend my time in this first declaration of who you are and the definition. I want to look at this illustration. And what I want to do with this illustration, these illustrations is I don't have time to unfold every one of them for you. So what I've done is I've, I've categorized them in five characteristics of a person of faith. Five characteristics of a person of faith. First, look at your neighbor and say, you are a person of faith. Go ahead. Look at your the other side, say, you are a person of faith. You say, that's really weird, but that's what we do in Africa, so that's what we're doing. So now when we come to verses 2 through the end of the chapter, I want us to look at these characteristics. And this is my goal. Hear me. My goal isn't to make you all go out there and be, want to commit suicide because you don't meet the standard. My goal is to encourage you, to uplift you, to remind yourself who you are because the world out there is trying to push a different idea of who we are. But this defines who we are and that's the point of the passage to encourage the believers. And I want to encourage you here this morning. Is that okay? I want to pretend you're my kids and just encourage you in, in the word. Let me give you the first characteristic of a Christian or a person of faith. A Christian or a person of faith is a person who confidently lives in light of God's word. It's a person who confidently lives in light of God's word. Hear this clearly. It's a person who lives in light of this what? In light of this book. That's who we are. Look with me in verse 7. 
and the life of Noah. This is crazy. He says this in verse 7, By faith Noah, being warned by God concerning events yet unseen, in reverence and reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. You can imagine Noah. He's in the middle of a completely corrupt society preaching truth and building an ark, building a boat in the middle of a dry land. I mean, come on, let's put this to life. Imagine building a boat bigger than this building. Is that crazy? You, how did he get the wood? He had to cut that wood down. Here he's building this boat. You can only imagine what was said to him. And why, what motivated him? What drew, drove him? And he was warned by God. One thing moved him. One thing drove him. And that was the word of what? It was the word of God. Noah gave his whole life in light of the word of God to live a crazy life. Because he believed this to be true. He believed it with all of his heart. Look with me in verse 8. It says, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to, to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Ha <laughs> ha! You can imagine Abraham hanging out. He goes to his wife and says, honey, let's, uh, let's move to Canaan. Canaan, well, let, let, let's move out to Canaan. Where, where are we going? Well, I, I'm not quite sure. Let's try and sell that one. My wife was having a hard enough time going to Africa. Even though she was 100% committed to serve Christ wherever. But you see, what drove him? He obeyed when he was called. It was the voice of God that motivated the servant of God. That's not just true of Abraham, but in verse 11 it says, Sarah, by faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age since she considered him faithful who had what? Promised. It was the promise of God that drove Sarah to conceive even beyond age. I love Verse 22, which speaks of Joseph ordering his bones to be taken to Canaan. Here before he dies, he says, take my bones to Canaan. You say, why did he say that? Because he knew God said after 400 years that we're going to Canaan and he knew it. It drove him. It controlled his life. It drove everything. My brothers and my sisters, let me tell you, one of the most distinctive marks of who we are is our belief and our confidence in this word. This is what we live for. This is what we know to be true. It's unmovable. You can't remove it. It's deeply embedded in us. This is what we know. And listen, we are being bombarded by so much. I am being bombarded so much. But we hold on to this against all odds, hope against hope, knowing the sweetness of this. Oh, guys, you're going to get out of here. And you're going to be bombarded with so many wrong ideologies. My closest friend from the Master's University abandoned the faith I love that guy. But I want you to know, just like if he were here, I would beg you, hold on to this truth. This is the truth. And this is what Christians live for. We live in light of the promises of this book. We live in light of God's word. This isn't just something we study alone. It's something that we put to the test. It's something we live out. It drives every part of our lives. Our whole lives are lived in light of these pages. We really believe Christ is returning, amen? We really believe there's a heaven and there's a hell. We really believe this stuff to be true. 
Oh, it, it, what's awesome about my life is I'm now old enough to declare with you this is truth. I've lived it. I've seen it. I know it. I love it. And I've dedicated my whole life to studying it, to studying it, to studying it, so that I might live it, live it, live it. We live in light of this. What does that mean? It means when a time of trouble comes, we don't just let ourselves go and and do whatever we want. But we look at that trial in light of God's word. When temptation comes, we don't just be carried away with our lust. We look at that sin in light of God's word. When we need direction, we need wisdom, we don't lean on our own understanding, but we acknowledge what God says. This drives everything. And listen, it's sufficient to drive everything. Every issue in your life, here it is. But you have to create a love affair with it now. Oh, love the word of God. Dedicate yourself to it now, now, now. And let your whole life be lived that I had no idea who I was going to marry. I was so afraid of marriage because my parents' marriage wasn't one that you would want. But the Bible, I said, so what does God's word say? A God-fearing woman is invaluable according to Proverbs 31. And I go, well, wait, if she fears God and I fear God, the Bible says according to Psalm 126 that I will be happy and it will be well with me. And so against all fear... I married Danielle, and let me tell you, I am the happiest of all men. Why? Because the word of God is true. In the middle of Africa, when I'm being persecuted and slandered, and and everybody's gossiping about me, and I read that the eyes of the Lord look to and fro throughout the earth to strongly support those whose hearts are completely his, I can take comfort in that and know that God will bring about prosperity in the end. With confidence just waiting on him and his promises. Dear friends, a Christian or a person of faith is someone who lives in light of this word. Please, young people, love this now. Dedicate yourself to this now and live everything in your life in light of it. Second characteristic, and we'll go quickly. Second characteristic is this. A Christian or a person of faith lives for heaven. A Christian or a person of faith lives for heaven. Look with me in verse 9 and 10. He says this about Abraham. It says, by faith he went out to live in a land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to a city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received, and in verse 13, look, it says this, all these died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them from afar, they greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. They were strangers and exiles on the earth. Strangers and what? They didn't live for here, they lived for there. Look what he says, continues, for people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. And if they had been thinking of that homeland from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a what? A better country. That is, verse 16, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. What drove these men of faith was the future inheritance, not the present. The future reality. We don't live for now. There's now is nothing to offer us. We live for there. We live for heaven. We live for our king. We live for our master. Our whole world revolves around a king on a throne of whom will return. And we live in light of that reality. It drives us. Look what he says of Moses in verse 26. Oh, and get inspired by these men. 
It says he considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt. For he was looking to the what? Reward. It was future reward. You see, look. Some of you, the majority of you will go out and be businessmen or women. Or you'll be moms or have some great career. But what you do with your time and money will define who you are. It'll define you. And when you choose to invest those things in kingdom reality, your heart will be kingdom-minded. And we'll talk about that on Friday. But listen, these people lived for heaven. That's what defined them. You can imagine Moses, rather than enjoying the, tr the, the, rather than enjoying the thr thrills and frills of the world, he lived with people for 40 years grumbling in a desert. Because he chose not to live for the now, but for the future reward. That's what drives Christians. Jesus himself, it says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despised the shame. It wasn't for the now, it was for the future. My dear brothers and sisters, we are, as Christians, as people of faith, we live for heaven. Philippians 3.20 says, For our citizenship is where? In heaven, from which we are eagerly wait a Savior. Matthew 6.19 says, We do not store treasures on earth where, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but rather we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Heaven is what we long for. It's what we live for. Oh, the world takes us back here, but we keep fighting for there. And you're going to have that battle your whole life. But you keep holding on to this, living for the future reality. The third characteristic, and I want to take you there, and we'll go through these really quickly, is that we abstain from sin. Look with me at verses 24 and 25, that we abstain from sin. Look at uh, verse 24 and 25 with me. It says this, by faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather what? Mistreatment with the people of God than enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. We don't live for the, the pleasures now. For he considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt for he's looking to the reward. Dear friends, Moses, rather than enjoying the passing pleasures of sin, he chose to get not enjoy them, but live for our master. I want to make sure we understand very clearly that a Christian is one who runs from sin. We are not marked by that. We will struggle with it. You will struggle with it. And we want to help you in that struggle. And your friends need to help you in that struggle. But we do not get bound down in it. We run past it because we keep living in light of the truth instead of allowing sin to define us. John Piper said, our chief enemy is, is the lie that says sin will make our futures happy, happier. Our chief weapon is the truth that says God will make our future happy, happier. And faith is the victory that overcomes the lie because faith is satisfied with God. My dear friends, I want you to know this, that the pleasures of sin, listen to me, the pleasures of sin will always lead to the misery of the sinner. The pleasures of sin will always lead to the misery of the sinner, and therefore we keep our faith in truth, and we push sin away that we might live for in obedience to our master. I don't know where you're at, I don't know what you're struggling with, but I just want to say, hey, let's just keep laying that sin aside, as it says in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Lay it aside. The encumbrances of sin, just lay it aside. Our, we were bought with a price, therefore we glorify God with these what? With these bodies. Can we say amen? And I know there's struggles. I know they're bombarded with pornography, bombarded with bad movies, bombarded with all of these things. Just keep throwing it aside. Keep throwing it aside. So easily entangled with these things. Throw it aside and live in light of this truth and live it for heaven. Number four, a Christian is described as a person who chooses to suffer. As a person who chooses to suffer. 
as we read already, it says that, that Moses chose ill treatment with the people of God. Chose ill treatment with the people of God. In verses 36 through 38, it says that others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute and afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world is not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains in mountains and dens and caves of the earth. Listen, we choose to suffer. That's what we choose. Listen, the mission field has been one major trial after one major trial over and over and over again. We know what suffering is because we've experienced it. There's hardly a day in Africa where we're not undergoing some pressure, some frustration, some discouragement from inside, from outside, but we press on and we choose that lifestyle. Why? Because we know whom we live for. We know who we love. And we've laid our lives down for this king no matter the cost. And so therefore we choose to, do, do, uh, to, to, to suffer. We choose to give up rather than to receive. We choose to live in smaller homes so we can give to others. We choose to stay up late to bear the burdens of others. We choose to be disliked so that others might hear the truth. We choose to not watch certain things so that we can spend time in the word of God. Oh, there's many pleasures we lay aside for the greater reality of knowing and serving and living for our master. Can we say amen? The fifth quality, the fifth quality is this. Characteristics, a Christian or a person of faith lives a radical and exciting life. Lives a radical and exciting life. Oh, guys, I would trade nothing. I left for that mission field. I left a lot here. I don't regret any of it. I have lived the greatest, most exciting, radical, crazy life, and it's awesome. Look at what these men hear. Look with me in verse 29. It says, by faith the people crossed the Red Sea as if they were on dry land. But the Egyptians, Egyptians when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith Rahab the prostitute did not uh, perish with those who were disobedient. Because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. What more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell you of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and of David and Samuel and the prophets who by faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. My dear friends, the last characteristic is that we live this radical and exciting life. You say, what do you mean by radical? What I mean by radical is we do what the natural man would never do. We build an ark in the middle of a dry land. We go and walk around as a war strategy, walk around a city seven times. Who does that? Who leaves riches and moves to Africa? Who does that? Who gives up things that they, and chooses to suffer? Who does that? We do that. We do that. We don't engage in certain sins that everybody else is doing. We live as outcasts, not ever feeling comfortable with the world. Why? Because we're Christians. We choose that and we live these radical lives doing what the natural man would never do. But not only is it radical, dear friends, it's exciting. You say, what makes it exciting is because we see God do what is humanly impossible. Oh, dear friends, I don't know what happened exactly when they walked around that city seven times. But I guarantee you, when they crossed that seventh time, they blew their trumpets and all of the walls came flying down. I'll get you, they went, Wah-ha! whoa, yeah. Don't you think? When that boat took off from that flood, I guarantee you, Moses went, I mean, Noah went to his knees and cried out, hallelujah. My dear friends, when Daniel stand in that lion's den and made friends with a hungry lion, 
He saw God do what was humanly impossible. Sometimes I wonder if we don't see God do great and incredible things because we don't live great lives of faith. I am amazed at what God has done in Africa. I'm amazed at the privilege that I've had in seeing God do the impossible. I live this reality. Dear friends, today I'm not coming to you as just a preacher. I'm coming to you as somebody who's lived out this truth now for 25 years after college and telling you this is the truth. Live it, love it, and let it saturate who you are. Guys, may you recognize that you are people of faith and may you live these radical and exciting lives. Let me pray with you. Father, thank you for the work of grace you've done in the hearts of these young people. Thank you for the fact that you have so intertwined in their own hearts to bring them to this great college. Now, Lord, I ask that you would entrust this truth into their hearts and that you would cause people to, who are not saved to come to life. And those who are saved to be strengthened and solidified in their own faith so that they can go out and live out this truth. Father, thank you for the privilege of opening God's word with such dear, awesome young people with this army of believers who are going to go take the world. We love you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for reigning and allowing us the joy of knowing you. It's through your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.